Hello, everyone. Just getting everything all set up. Do you know what that smell is? That smell is the laboratory. We haven't been live for way too long. Um, the laboratory, if you've never been with us before, is a twice monthly free webinar. Um, it's on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, hosted by Holly Chantel, the president of The Land of Brand, and we talk about different topics in your coaching business and your brand. So how do you build a trailblazing brand that stands out from everyone else when oftentimes everything seems to have been done before? And that's actually one of the topics we're gonna be talking about today is the getting off of the marketing bandwagon. Um, because as you may have noticed, uh, everyone else is doing a lot of the same things you're being taught to do and might be doing in your own business and that can make it really difficult to stand out and and you you really blend in with everyone else um, which is clearly not the point of branding um, so if you um, are joining us on Facebook live this is our first time uh, try, uh, broadcasting the webinar live so um, I'm gonna do the best I can uh, to manage both. Um, but uh, if you want to join us in the webinar where you can actually ask questions and participate, um, you can go to thelandofbrand.com and sign up for, uh, if you go to the free webinars tab, you can sign up there and get uh, notifications every time we are broadcasting live. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and just move this screen over here and I'm going to share the presentation with you. All right. And while I'm doing that, I'm also going to open up my Q&A box and the chat. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do this all before because uh, I was setting up the Facebook Live. So next time, I promise, will be much smoother. All right. So if you are on the Zoom webinar, um, you have the chat box and the Q&A box if you want to um, type in there during the webinar. I will uh, be happy to answer questions and you can actually participate that way. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into today's topic. All right, so the topics that we're going to be talking about today are one, the bandwagon phenomena and why it's pretty much like an inv invisibility coach, <laughs> invisibility cloak for coaches. How to unlock your own creativity with reverse engineering, which is not nearly as brainy as it sounds, and why your personality is the fuel your marketing needs to stand out. And um, hi, Anne. Welcome, Anne. Anne's talking to me on the chat. Um, so, all right, so I missed a slide. Wow, we're batting a thousand this morning. Uh, so, first, let's talk about what the bandwagon phenomena is. Um, so the bandwagon phenomena is all of these marketing fads that you're seeing um, that people just kind of jump on the bandwagon. So there'll be like the next big thing, like telesummits, or right now it's challenges. Everyone and their mother is doing, you know, five-day challenges, seven-day challenges, 30-day challenges. It's become like the next big thing. A year ago they were still novel. It was still like a couple people were doing them, having a lot of success with building their lists, a lot of success with um, launching their products and programs, and then everyone jumped on the bandwagon, and now my feed is full of Facebook ads about doing a challenge. And what happens is you start seeing something that's working and you're being told that it's work, working, you're taking courses and classes and all of the guru coaches are telling you like, this is the next big thing, this is the thing you need to jump on. And what you're doing is that you're jumping on the bandwagon. And um, uh, let's see, telesummits are, are making like a comeback right now. But you know, a um, back in 2009, telesummits when they were just coming out, that was the next big thing. Everyone and their mother was doing telesummits. Um, Jeff Walker's video launches, uh, product launch formula, um, that has been going uh, recurring yearly. That course he, the 
product launch formula course. So more and more people are learning how to do these three part video launches. And it becomes, again, the next big thing, the bandwagon that everyone's jumping in on. And what happens is everyone's marketing looks the same. You start seeing the same format over and over again, and you begin to ignore it. You start hearing about these challenges, and, and there's this challenge and that challenge, and you can't possibly participate in all of them, so you begin to ignore them. So what happens is this next big thing becomes the next big thing that is ignored. So coaches will, will use these strategies to um, in an attempt to build their business, an attempt to launch their next big program, and they're not getting the traction that they expect or that they've been promised because the market's being saturated. It's, it's, it becomes cookie cutter. You begin being hidden by the very thing that you're using to put yourself out there with. So it become, that's why it becomes an invisibility cloak. And invisibility cloaks were cool in Harry Potter, but they are not cool in your business. And here's the thing is, I'm not telling you that these strategies are wrong. Like, should you not be doing telesummits? Should you not be doing challenges? Should you not be doing three-part video launches? Absolutely not. These, and, and by, I realize that's a double negative there. What I'm saying is that these things are not wrong. These are not the wrong strategies for you. You just need to do them in a certain way. So it's not that they don't work because clearly they do. And you've probably seen me use some of these in the land of brand. I've hosted telesummits. I've done three-part video launches. I haven't done a challenge yet, but I've been considering it. So it's not that these strategies are wrong and I'm telling you not to do them. That is absolutely friggin' not leave the, <laughs> whatever that word is, not the case. But you need to put your own flair on it. You, if you want to blaze your own trail and show up as an authority in your niche, then you can't be following a blueprint. That is the mistake that I see so many coaches making is following someone else's blueprint. They see what someone else is doing, they copy it, or they've taken a course where the, per, where the person offering the course is offering you templates where you can cut and paste, or templates where, you know, just follow these steps and you will um, you know, be able to create whatever, whatever it is. So um, something right now that's another bandwagon phenomena is asking really random questions on Facebook to get engagement. Someone is teaching, um, you know, your posts are going to be ranked higher. You're going to get more engagement. Your, your uh, you know, Facebook juice, your Google juice is going to be uh, raised if you're getting more engagement. So the way you need to be doing that is to ask these questions. And I'm sure that they're giving lists of what these questions are and where they should be going in your, edit your Facebook editorial calendar because I see the same questions over and over again. What are you cooking for dinner? You know, I like tacos. Do you like burritos? Tacos versus burritos. Like they're the most inane questions. And what's funny is that sometimes I find myself answering them because they're also fun to answer. I like, I love cooking. I love talking about what I'm cooking, what I'm cooking tonight because it's, it's fun. It's interesting. So on one hand, yeah, like that's kind of a fun way to create engagement. But on the other hand, when you're using those cookie cutter templates, I'm fine. I'm here. I'm seeing a lot of people getting irritated with these questions. Um, and again, you start to just be ignored because the market is getting saturated. It's, it's, uh, you're becoming invisible because once people catch on to that, this is just a marketing ploy and you're not actually genuinely interested in what I like to eat on a daily basis, they stop answering it. So if you're following a blueprint, then you're becoming a part of the noise. If you're just copying and pasting templates, you're going to become a part of the noise. And that is not what you want in your business. You need to rise above. So what we want to do is we want to take these strategies that are working and that you're seeing people doing, and we want to change them and tweak them into something that is really you. And that is really what branding is all about, is making, putting your personal touch, your flair, your message, your passion into everything that you're doing in a way that shows up as unique and different. And the cool thing is, 
there really are no original ideas anymore. Everything has been done before. So it kind of like takes off the pressure of being completely unique because all you really need to do is to put your own flair on it. But before we can put our own flair on it, we have to understand what is the foundational pieces of why this works so that you can then take those pieces and craft them into something that is you. So instead of taking a template and just following that, instead we're going to break down these strategies into their bare bone pieces and then rebuild them as something that is you. Um, so I, this is called reverse engineering. And whenever you use the word engineer, and, and then especially, you know, reverse engineer, it sounds super, super brainy and nerdy, but it's not. You don't have to be, you know, some brain in order to make this work for you. Um, so all you do is um, you take a strategy that you're considering, so challenges, Facebook ads, telesummit, whatever it is, and consider why does it work? So what are the fundamental pieces that that strategy is built upon that actually makes it engaging, that gets people on your list, that gets people to buy? And then how do you, you when you have what those elements are, how do you recreate those elements in a different way? And one of the easiest ways to do that is to add your personality and your personal flair into each of those pieces. And I'm going to break, I'm going to break this down for you. Um, this is what I'm really good at is, is really breaking things down into their fundamental pieces and then showing you how to uh, brand or, you know, apply your brand to each one. So here are some examples based on the list that I gave you in the beginning of what the, um, just four bandwagon phenomena that I'm seeing. Um, I am using those in these examples. So first, challenges, because those are like super hot right now. Challenges, uh, why do they work? Well, they create excitement and engagement for a, sh a condensed period of time. This allows you to get momentum. Um, so it's something that people are committing to a short period of time, so they are more likely to stay engaged versus if it was a long, um, a long like couple months kind of thing, they might start tapering off. But when they're short and condensed and high energy, it's much easier to keep people's attention. The other cool thing about challenges is that people see results right away. So if they're following the steps you're giving them, and with it, ideally with a challenge, they're very minute baby steps, um, they begin to see results. Not only that, but because there's all these other people also participating in the challenge, they start to see the results of other people. Usually there's a Facebook group involved or some way, um, some form of accountability where people are posting what they're doing and what results they're getting. And this kind of just creates a ball of energy that is, is starts building a community. So they start seeing results right away. They start seeing other people have results right away. Creates more excitement, again, as to that engagement. And then last but not least, it's not a huge time commitment for participants. And it's something that's very easy to say yes to. It's not a time commitment. It's not a financial commitment. Um, it's something that they can definitely see the benefit in. So it's very easy to say yes. So these are the foundational pieces of why, a ch why challenges are successful. Next would be telesummits. So telesummits, um, there we're going to look at telesummits from a slightly different angle because telesummits are, uh, it's not just you doing it. A telesummit also has a, a wider reach, a uh, wider reaching effect into your own business, not just um, why it's beneficial for like, how do we get participants engaged? It's also about you building partnerships. Um, so a telesummit allows you to build new partnerships gives you an excuse to reach out to people that you might other, otherwise be afraid to reach out to, which is really silly, by the way, because, um, you know, we're, we're all human. We all like to talk to people. We all want to help each other build their businesses. Um, so never be afraid to reach out to someone. Hold on, I got a cough. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> they allow you to get in front of a lot of people at once. So again, it's like a critical mass of, of attention. It's, it's an event. It's something that has a defined start and end point, a defined deliverable, and um, it's all being promoted at the same time. So a lot of people are going to see it. So it's, it's, again, you're creating like this critical mass of excitement and engagement. 
It's perceived as high value to participants because they're getting kind of like the smorgasbord of information that they can choose from that is of interest to them. Um, because ideally, your tell summit is very targeted on your audience and what they what it is they need, and you're bringing in experts to help deliver that. So it's perceived as really really valuable. Yet there's no cost involved. No real-time commitment involved. So it's, again, very easy to say yes to. And again, creates excitement and engagement. So these are, again, just some fundamental pieces about why tell summits work. And I want you to start thinking, what are other ways that you could create these fundamental pieces? So I'm going to get, I'm going to get into the other two examples, but start thinking now about, okay, what are some other ways that I could build relationships with new partners? What are some other ways that I could get into a lot in front of a lot of people at once? What are some ways that I could create excitement and engagement in a short period of time? So like a condensed event or a condensed time frame where I'm holding people's attention, um, holding their attention span, and then you know, curating that attention and, and, and pointing it to something like an offer or to um, your website or a webinar or whatever it is that you want the next step to be. So these are why these, the, this is why these strategies work. So how could you recreate those benefits in other ways? And this will kind of help you to start thinking creatively and think um, with a different lens. Because oftentimes we're, on, we're only looking at strategies as, you know, am I able to complete it? You know, does it sound like it's gonna work? Um, is this something that I can do and want to do? And not looking at what, what is the foundational elements of why it works and can I do those things in another way? So more examples, three-part video launch. Um, I like the three-part video launch because it gives you more time to tell the story of your product. So we're also creating engagement. Ideally, we're getting a lot of eyeballs on it at once. So this combines some of the um, other uh, elements that are in uh, from the previous slide. Um, and now you're telling a story. You're being seen on camera, so you're building major trust and credibility in a short period of time. Again, we're condensing things. And then you're creating multiple touches over a short period of time that lead to a sale. So with challenge, you're creating multiple touches, but we're not selling anything. It's more uh, per participant driven. The touches are, are more about, about creating engagement. It's more of a list building activity than it is a sales activity. With a video launch, Every touch point that you're having with a customer is moving them one step closer to being ready to make a decision to buy your product. So it, it, the, the attention is, um, the content is curated and, and toward a particular goal, um, which is a little bit different. And then Facebook ads. Um, so Facebook ads, these are a little bit trickier um, because Facebook ads are usually geared toward a particular marketing strategy, but I want to look at them on their own um, because I see, you know, just scrolling through my Facebook feed, I'm seeing a lot of ads that are just kind of cookie cutter. Like they all look the same. They have a video of this very, this very high production glamorous video of someone I have never heard before telling me stuff that, um, you know, how great they are and what amazing results they've had. Um, well, what really drives me nuts is when I'm seeing the videos that have nothing to do with me. Hold on. Again, they become, oh, shoot, did I just mute myself? Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if I unmuted myself, I did. Um, so the Facebook ads, um, are a great way for you to show up in front of prospects where they're already hanging out. Um, you can, they're, they're somewhat targeted, but it's kind of, it, it can get a little tricky because um, sometimes they're, they're not as easy to target. Like I, there's an ad that I'm seeing right now about, you know, um, are you tired of your seven figure business? And to me, it, it, you know, no offense to the person creating it. I don't know if, you know, if you'd ever even see this, um, but 
I know for my audience and, and myself, for one, I'm not, my goal is not to build, my, building a seven figure business is not one of my goals. <laughs> Let, let's put it that way. I'm not saying that I, my goal is not to build one, um, but that's not on my, that's not on my radar right now. That's to me, that's just a, a number that is not, um, that's not how I measure my satisfaction in my business. Two, if I had a seven figure business, I don't think I'd be complaining about it. Um, so obviously her market is a very specific market. And when you see, uh, when you see ads that are just like clearly not for you, um, it can get irritating. And, and again, you just, you begin to get ignored. So what happens is, is like everyone's creating all these Facebook ads and you're starting to see them in your feed. And it's almost like they're like, buying your attention for something that's a waste of your time and it's just it's it can get really really frustrating it can get frustrating and, and again is just hiding you when you go to do facebook ads so in order for you to rise above that and for you to stand out as being the one that people should be looking at you again you need to add your own flair to it put personality into it and make it unique. Um, so why do they work? They show up in prospects where they're already hanging out on Facebook. They create multiple touches over a short period of time. So if you're using Facebook ads correctly, or let's not say correctly, you're using Facebook ads in a more um, in-depth strategy, you can actually uh, create multiple touches. So um, you have one video showing for this period of time, then there's the next video, then there's the next video. Then um, if people are you know, going to, clicking through to pages or they watch a webinar or they're going to a sales page, you can again tailor your ads to follow those actions. So Facebook ads are really, really cool because you can customize someone's experience and basically follow them through your sales cycle and create those touch points as they're going. And this is something that's, that's often missed because it is a pretty complex, uh, complex um, concept and it can cost a lot of money to do. But again, how else can you do that? So um, in the last but not least, you can curate attention to whatever you want. So a Facebook ad, literally it's an ad for you know, whatever it is you want people's eyeballs on. You can do a Facebook ad for a blog post. Um, I did that once for, um, I was running Facebook ads for a webinar. So I created these blog posts that um, had a similar, similar, uh, solved a similar problem as the webinar so that I was attracting um, people that had that problem so I could create this audience of people that would want my webinar. And then, um, you know, from that, we're doing ads for the webinar to that audience. So there's a lot of different ways that you can really strategically think about, you know, how to curate attention to what you want people looking at right now. So that's why Facebook ads are really, really cool. But how do you make them you? How do you do them in a way that's really standing out from all of those other um, ads that are out there? How do you not look like everyone else? <laughs> and says, I'd rather have a seven figure portfolio. <laughs> yes. Um, so this is, this is all well and good, you know, to understand how these strategies work, why they work. And they're probably making you want to do these strategies more because now you're like, you're, this is how, um, this is how the bandwagon happens because you know that they're working, you know why they're working now. So it's like, yeah, I want to go ahead and do that. So Let's take these fun foundational elements and how can you replicate these advantages in with different strategies in different ways? Um, so for example, um, let's see, I wanna say it might've been two years ago now. Um, I feel like time is just getting away from me. Um, so instead of doing a telesummit, I started to do, um, I created a podcast that was telesummit-like. Um, so that gave me the ability to reach out to potential partners, 
build new relationships. Um, and instead of, and you know, they could promote the, um, promote the topics, promote the web, the podcast. And what it did, did was, is it had all of those same benefits that I listed as a telesummit, but it was done over a longer period of time. So instead of being a condensed effort that took me a lot of time to do, um, it was something that I could do at my leisure, um, create that same, uh, create all of those benefits that I listed, but do it in my way. So that's just one example. And I'm sure you can think of other examples. If, if you have any, definitely type them in. I'd love to hear them. And then how do you, how can you stick, how could you stick with these strategies? So use these strategies at face value. So creating a challenge or creating a three-part video series or a telesummit or whatever other marketing strategy that you're thinking about and add your own flair. This is where I would say my specialty is, and, and this is where I, um, I lean toward, is taking something that's already being done, reverse engineering why it works, and then adding your flair to those, those pieces. So you do this with your personality. Your personality makes this easy. Um, so your personality can come out in how you themify something. You can create a persona, play, play a, um, a, a larger than life persona um, that isn't, you know, the person that's, that's that face value, like I am a coach, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, like it's all about me, 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 but instead create a character. I'm going to give you examples of these in a second. And then last, you know, it might be to tell a story, to tie whatever it is you're doing into your message and your story in a unique way. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, so themify, obviously the land of brand, like we themify pretty much everything um, because I, it, it's just how my mind works. Um, so the laboratory, this is a theme. This is a, you know, you, there's a lot of coaches offering community webinars. There's a lot of um, free, uh, free series, webinar series, blog posts, vlogs, everything. Um, but this one has a particular theme. It adds visual interest. It adds a way that we type, that we, um, like a lexicon, the language that I use when I talk about it. Um, it adds a format that's, you know, predictable and easy to follow. So it, it adds flair to it. It's not seen as just every other community webinar. <clears throat> um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of another one. Um, brand Tales. I don't want to, I'm not all of these examples are going to be from me, by the way, but Brand Tales, the podcast that I was talking about, that one had a fairy tale theme. So I was interviewing, interviewing my, um, my participants, my, uh, colleagues basically and interviewing them about their their brand and the stories of how they got to where they are their pitfalls failures awesome ideas and then at the end of each one I would ask you know what um, if you were a fairy tale character who would you be or what would you be and then I created caricatures of them and that became the cover of that podcast episode so it's themifying and it shows up as different and it was really really cool because everyone loved their cartoon characters so much that they were able, they, they were more likely to promote them on social media and share them with each other. And it also stands out when I'm promoting them on, so there, I still promote them on the land of brand page and they stand out because it's not just a stock photo. It's not something that you you're used to seeing. So it stands out because it's cool because it's a cartoon, and then when you recognize the person in the cartoon and it's a caricature of them, it just adds like that other level of cool that makes you want to click on it. So themifying is really, really fun, and it's not always too difficult. Um, just thinking about, you know, what, what types of concepts or themes could, lay, could you lay over your challenge, or what types of concepts or themes could you lay over your telesummit? Um, I'm going to give you one more. Uh, just because Telesummit triggered this. Um, when I did my Telesummit a few years ago, it was the brand Bazaar. And the Bazaar was like this, um, this, like the smorgasbord of like all of these different topics and branding that you could kind of pick and choose what you wanted to. And we had kind of this circus theme where, you know, I was the ringleader and we had, you know, pulling back the curtains and every, um, all the intros I wrote were like, 
this more of like a circus ringleader and talking about like their feats of strength and their freakishly good looks and like adding flair to how it was delivered. The content and the interview questions were very, very similar to what you see in any telesummit, but the flair around it created a lot of excitement and really stood out from all of the other telesummits being done. Um, so all that took was just a little bit of creative writing, a little bit of personality. Um, it doesn't necessarily take like a lot of, you know, insane graphic design or insane production value. Um, so you can themify things really in just how you talk about them and how you write about them and um, just the fun that you're having. Another example would be, um, so creating personas. Um, there's a couple of people that come to mind when I think of uh, personas. One would be Stella Orange. You guys might be familiar with her. She's awesome. She does a challenge a couple times a year called the Write-a-thon. Um, and she, over the last couple uh, challenges she's done, she has this kind of persona that she jumps into. You know, she, she's a runner. She loves, um, she it, she trains as a runner. She's awesome. And that's something that she's personally interested in. So she puts on this like curly wig, takes pictures of herself, you know, running in different places. Um, she has this really uh, kind of dorky getup that she wears. And, and that's the persona she has for that challenge. And she also kind of themifies it with, um, I remember when I participated in promoting it, I'd get, I'd have these like badges and these, these signs that you might, um, wear or hold up at some kind of like rally um, to kind of rally people around, you know, shut up and write, like get, let's get this done and that kind of thing. Um, so that's a way to create a persona. Another person that's really good at this is Lou Bertone. Um, Lou Bertone um, is a video marketing, he's just amazingness. Um, so Lou is, has created all kinds of personas. Um, he had a, uh, I don't remember their names, but there was one that was like modeled after Moses and he would give you like the 10 commandments of video marketing. Um, or he has Cecil B. DeMoron, um, where he dresses up with a little, you know, French hat and, you know, gives you video marketing tips. Um, there's a couple other ones he had. They're all, they're all really, really funny. Uh, for once, I think I remember him putting on a mask, like a, it was either like a horse mask or a squirrel mask or something and delivering his video tips. And what this does is, it, it for him it it took off the pressure of being face to camera because he actually does, even though he's a video guy he does not like being on camera um, so it for him it lessened that pressure and um, it also allowed him to deliver his tips and his strategies and create engagement and create excitement all those foundational pieces that we were talking about creating engagement and excitement um, through this engaging character, this ways that people are not used to seeing, like normally you're just seeing someone, you know, hello, I'm, you know, Lou Berton, I do this, I do that, blah, 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 here's what you should do. And it's all well and good. And the strategy might be amazing. And usually they are with him. Um, but when you add that extra flair and that extra personality, it just makes it more shareable, makes it more engaging, makes it more exciting. Um, and it gives you some of those foundational pieces just from adding your personal flair. And I'm not saying you have to like go be someone you're not, but sometimes it can be fun to kind of themify an event as well as themify yourself um, or act as if in some ways. And the last but not least would be telling a story. Um, so telling a story um, usually relates back to uh, your message in your business and your brand. And you can tell a story with your, with your video sequences, or you can tell a story in your marketing that creates engagement, that creates excitement, that creates inspiration. Um, sometimes that story might just be, um, so I'm gonna give an example of a, um, it's a, this is the funniest example, it was a Facebook ad I saw. It was a, a tent company. And the tent company, it was the most ridiculous product in the world. It was a tent that you could tie to three trees and hung off the ground. And the story behind it that they were selling was um, 
that it was like a zero zero footprint like you didn't have to disturb the forest at all because you were not sleeping on the ground um, to me it seemed ridiculous because where the heck are you going to be able to find a space that you can tie off three trees um, how the heck would you get in and out of it um, and it just it I couldn't think of that possibly being comfortable. So it, it's funny because the product itself didn't make no sense. Um, but the story was what got you. It got, it, it engaged, it talked about, you know, the impact of campers and the, um, the story behind why the company existed and why this was their mission. And it really connected you with that. And it, it's memorable because I mean, this has been months later. I didn't actually buy it obviously because I think it's ridiculous, but I still remember the story and I still remember the, um, it still was very attention grabbing and how they were showing the, how they were displaying their story. Um, so how can you tell a story and what is your story? And it might not be really related directly back to your brand, but maybe you tie whatever it is you're promoting to a story that's important to you or a story that's important to your audience. So those are just a couple ideas. Um, this went on, this was actually a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. So thank you for bearing with me. I hope if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, and let's just do a quick recap of what it is the the points that we made today so one if you're doing anything by the blueprint copy and pasting templates etc you're automatically going to be unoriginal you're automatically going to sound like someone else because someone else gave you that language and there are, are hundreds uh, or maybe thousands of people using those templates you're going to you're basically putting an invisibility cloak over your business the next big thing sounds great but you can make it better with your own personality so how do you add your flair to those foundational pieces that make this this strategy work so why does it work and then how can you add flair and, and more impact to those pieces and then last but not least reverse engineering sounds really brainy but basically all it is is helping you understand why behind something and then making it your own so when you can take something and, and kind of back step into why it works and then rebuild it your own way that's when you're going to be creating something really really unique so next week um, we so normally this is on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month um, we had to skip last Wednesday because flu apocalypse hit my house um, so uh, that's why we're meeting this week and then next week we are still meeting March 22nd 12 o'clock Eastern and we're going to be talking about why the best brands aren't actually unique. So um, you may have noticed, probably, um, that there's other people offering very similar services to you. There's other people that are um, might have the exact same message as you, and it can be really, really discouraging. And some of these people might be you know, leagues ahead of where you are in your business, maybe years ahead of where you are in your business. And that can be really intimidating. Um, so we're going to talk about why you don't actually have to be completely original and different in order to outcompete them and why they themselves aren't actually that unique. And it's really just in how they're branding themselves. So again, we're going to be kind of reverse engineering a little bit on what branding is, and then how you can replicate that for your business so that you can stand out with your completely unoriginal idea, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, why you don't have to be outlandishly different in order to um, have a successful business. So that is, I don't see any questions, so we are going to wrap up. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, and I will see you all next week. Bye, everyone.